the greatest of human endeavors is a risky business. Yeah, we've had a problem here. NASA led the world into the exploration of space, but behind the scenes, out of the public eye, mistakes, mishaps, and failures plague the space industry. Obviously a major malfunction. Discover how NASA space failures further exploration. NASA's space shuttle program ended in 2011, and NASA is now focused on placing humans on Mars. To achieve that goal, NASA is designing the Orion spacecraft, which will take humans deeper into space than ever before. NASA is building on the success of the space shuttle, and more importantly, learning from their mistakes. 2006, three years after Space Shuttle Columbia broke apart while returning to Earth from the International Space Station, NASA prepares to launch a shuttle for just the second time since the accident. The first return to flight mission a year earlier was a resounding success. Now, if all goes well with this mission, the Space Shuttle program will be cleared to return to full operational status with numerous Space Shuttle missions once again scheduled each year. Perfection is not possible, but NASA knows how important the mission is and needs it to be as flawless as possible. July 4th, 2006, American Independence Day. A fitting metaphor for today's launch. Led by veteran commander Stephen Lindsay and pilot Mark Kelly, a crew of seven astronauts are set to rip through Earth's atmosphere en route to the International Space Station. America is ready to return the space shuttle to flight, so good luck and Godspeed, Discovery. I can't think of a better place to be here on the 4th of July on the Independence Day to be getting ready to launch into space. Kennedy Space Center buzzes with nervous excitement. Launch control is tense, but unknown to the spectators, media, and dignitaries in attendance, an event is about to send shock waves through NASA's flight 12, team and drive 11, tension in launch 10, control to new heights. 9, 8, 7, 6, go for main engine start, main engine start, 2, 1, booster ignition, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery, returning to the space station, paving the way for future missions beyond. Powered by two solid rocket boosters and 5.6 million pounds of thrust, Space Shuttle Discovery streaks through the atmosphere at rapidly increasing speeds. Hundreds of systems are monitored by launch control engineers. Then, just 22 seconds into ascent, readings from a pressure transducer literally go off the charts. Carl, what we got? Looks like we got an overpressurization condition on the FRCS. Engineers watch helplessly for the next 60 seconds as the pressure hits levels never before seen, then shockingly goes even higher. So high that the pressure transducer can no longer measure the pressure. The problem is in the forward section of Discovery in front of the crew module where the astronauts are. The shuttle is already traveling over 1,000 miles per hour. In another 60 seconds, it will reach 3,000 miles per hour. A few minutes later, 18,000 miles per hour, nine times faster than a rifle's bullet. Nothing can be done until Discovery makes orbit. But one minute and 14 seconds into ascent, the pressure transducer starts recording the pressure again, and it begins to fall. Within another 60 seconds, the readings are within normal range again. Engineers are relieved for the moment. All other flight readings seem to be normal. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Discovery reaches orbit with no other issues. The crew begins their mission duties, which primarily involve testing new safety and repair procedures designed from what NASA learned from the Columbia accident. Back at launch control, questions about the massive pressure buildup grow. NASA has never seen this problem before, and engineers initially question whether the pressure transducer is bad and giving false readings. Could be an instrumentation problem. Yeah, that's true. We'll have to do a data retrieval and see what we've got. Okay. okay. Put that in work. If it's working properly and the pressure was real, then the lives of the astronauts could still be in danger. Chris Curtis is the orbiter subsystem manager. He's assigned to head up an investigation team. During ascent, you've got air trying to escape out of the FRCS on ascent, running back through the vent doors. Air's trying to move. Basically, it's like a balloon trying to pop. The FRCS is the forward reaction control system. It contains many of the primary thrusters used to maneuver discovery while it's in space. 
It's full of tanks of toxic, highly explosive rocket fuel. Mark Mansfield, a structures analyst, is concerned that the pressure could have been or warped discovery inside the FRCS. As you load up these parts uh, with pressure, uh, you could get to the point where you could break some piece of hardware or break a skin panel, uh, do something that could be detrimental to the mission or catastrophic. When NASA says catastrophic, they mean discovery could be destroyed while returning to Earth. This mission is the second test flight after the loss of Columbia. Success and NASA would return to a full flight schedule. A failure would mean the immediate end of the space shuttle program. Find out the root cause of the problem and see if we can get safe. NASA needs answers and fast. While the crew of Discovery tests new safety and repair techniques required after the loss of Columbia and resupplies the International Space Station, NASA's investigation team works feverishly on the ground. If we do have a real problem, then we have to concern ourselves with the overpressurization of the FRCS cavity and the loads exerted on the bulkhead, and that would result in some stresses to some of the uh, struts and the associated bolts. They only have 13 days to decide if Discovery is safe to return. If not, then NASA will have to scramble a never-before-attempted rescue mission. We laid out a, basically an investigation process of what do we do to get comfortable to land the vehicle. The pressure transducer is the first suspect. Nalena, do we have a real problem? Is this data real? Well, there doesn't seem to be a problem with the instrumentation. The data does seem to be real. It doesn't seem like there's a problem with the transducer itself. It is remotely tested and seems to be working fine. But the transducer cannot be fully tested while in space, and so the team cannot conclusively eliminate a faulty transducer until Discovery returns. For the safety of the crew, they must presume the pressure was real. Comparing the pressure readings to the averages of previous launches, reveals that the peak pressure was at least three and possibly four times the normal reading. And because the pressure went off scale, engineers cannot immediately determine how bad the pressure might be, making it difficult to know how much damage might have occurred to Discovery. As the shuttle ascends, and air inside the forward reaction control system expands. It is normally released through two vent ports in the bulkhead. The only way the pressure could be real is if not just one, but both vent ports were blocked at the same time. It would take both ports to be blocked to get this type of pressure change. So we're thinking what potentially could happen to, is it you know, the probable to block both ports? Because of the design of the forward reaction control system, the likelihood that both vent ports could be blocked simultaneously seemed almost impossible. While the team was becoming more convinced that the pressure transducer or some related instrumentation must not be working properly, they still had to assume that the pressures were real or risk discovery being destroyed in re-entry along with the entire crew. Do we need to do any type of testing while they're on orbit to see what real margins are? I mean, analysis is one thing, but... What we have to do is go back and look at the certification analysis and see what uh, loads uh, we've analyzed for and then come back and look at what our overpressure condition is, go back and redo the analysis for the new overpressure condition and come up with a new margin. Days are spent exhaustively extrapolating the pressure readings to estimate a maximum pressure differential, a worst case scenario. How would the worst possible pressure affect discovery? Would there be damage? If so, how much? The result of the analysis has showed that we were close. We went and did some testing. Testing showed that uh, we were in good shape and uh, based on uh, the results of both analysis and tests, we said we we're okay to come back. NASA gives the okay for discovery to return based on solid scientific analysis, but any unexplained anomaly haunts engineers until the spacecraft and crew are all safely on the ground. Mission Control monitors the pressure transducer carefully during the 30-minute descent through the atmosphere. All readings are normal, and discovery lands without incident. Now you touch down. As soon as Discovery is safely in the orbiter processing facility, engineers fully test the pressure transducer, hoping to finally resolve the mystery. They are dismayed when it is conclusively proven that the pressure transducer is working perfectly. The pressure during launch was real. 
the team will soon discover the shocking truth behind the massive pressure buildup during the critical July 4, 2006 launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. The massive pressure recorded 22 seconds in the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery was almost four times the normal pressure. With proof that the pressure transducer was working correctly, NASA is faced with a growing mystery. A mystery that must be resolved before the space shuttle program can be cleared to return to a regular flight schedule. NASA orders the micro-inspection team to inspect the vent ports to determine if anything is blocking the ports. A tiny camera system called a borescope is inserted through the ports, enabling the team to see the inside of the vent all the way into the FRCS. Both vents are inspected, but the vents are clear. No obstructions or debris is found. Nothing is blocking the ports, and no other evidence is found to help solve the mystery. Everything in the vent ports looks perfect. Dismayed, the team pours over engineering and design schematics for answers. Near the vent ports, TCS blankets, or thermal control system blankets, cover many surfaces in the FRCS. TCS blankets protect the spacecraft's surfaces from the extreme heat and cold of space. TCS blankets are located in front of the vent ports on an adjacent wall of the FRCS. It's just the probability of blankets blocking the ports was very low. I mean, very, very low. It's just never happened in the past. We've never had a problem with the TCS blankets. Anthony Chambers oversees the thermal control subsystem hardware for discovery. The original blanket was installed underneath a PVD drain line, perch bin and drain, drain line. It's about a quarter inch diameter stainless steel drain line. And this drain line acts as a billowing limiter for the blanket. When the blankets are installed correctly, it is impossible for them to block the vent ports. The team reviews closeout inspection photos of the blankets. The last closeout photos of the blankets show that they were installed correctly, so the drain lines, by design, would prevent the blankets from coming near the vent ports. As frustration grows, another borescope inspection is scheduled. But this time, the area is accessed by a topside electrical panel to get a better look. Then, a breakthrough. We can see that the blanket was installed over the drain line. Somehow, the blanket is over the drain lines instead of behind. Testing confirmed that without the drain line to hold them back, the blankets could be sucked into the vent ports during ascent, creating the intense buildup of pressure inside the FRCS. And during re-entry and landing, the rush of air into the FRCS would have blown the blankets back into their original positions, which is why the first borescope inspection found nothing blocking the vent ports. When you're coming back to Earth, you actually have air rushing back into the vehicle. So you're actually pushing the problem back to its original state. NASA is relieved to finally know what the problem is and confirms that the Ford reaction control system was not damaged by the pressure. But now the investigation team is faced with an even greater mystery. Why are the blankets installed wrong? An extensive investigation reveals that a series of mistakes and mishaps spanning several years resulted in the blankets being installed wrong, which led to the dangerous pressure buildup during launch. The original thermal blankets were installed in 1984 when Discovery was being built. At the time, NASA was designing the space shuttles to fly for only 10 years, or 100 missions, and the blankets were never expected to be removed. The original installation of the blanket didn't have a slit, an access slit here. It's just a, a, a cutout for the bracket. So the, the blanket went on first. The bracket was installed, the blanket went over the bracket, and then the line was installed. The blanket was trapped underneath that line. Nearly 20 years later, in 2002, during a series of major modifications to Discovery, the forward reaction control system was removed, and the blankets were removed for the first time to inspect the structure beneath the blankets. We had to remove this blanket. So we had to cut it out. And when we put it back in, we had to provide a slit line to allow that blanket to slide in around and underneath that bracket. The new blankets were installed correctly under the drain lines and flew without incident in July of 2005 during Discovery's historic return to flight mission. But when Discovery returned, the FRCS was removed again. Could this have been when the blankets were installed wrong? But why was the FRCS removed? The investigation is about to discover a cascade of mistakes.
The forward reaction control system was removed from discovery after the successful 2005 mission. The pressure buildup happened during the 2006 mission, so something must have happened to the blankets while the FRCS was removed. But why was it removed? The investigation team discovered that a temporary repair that was cleared for the 2005 mission had to be permanently fixed and it could only be fixed by removing the FRCS. We were performing the crew cabin leak check. What we noticed is that we had excessive leakage, so we did a lot of troubleshooting trying to figure out where the leak was coming from. The crew cabin leak check is performed to make sure that the fragile atmosphere inside the spacecraft that keeps the astronauts alive while in space stays inside and does not leak out. Obviously, a critical test, and this time, air was leaking out. Well, it was narrowed down to what we call a bulkhead feed-through receptacle. The receptacle permits critical wiring to pass through the bulkhead from the crew cabin to the FRCS and is supposed to completely seal the area so no air escapes from the crew module. Whitkopf's team discovered that the receptacle had not been tightened down enough after a damaged connector pin had been replaced. We have other receptacles in this area. We believe that possibly the socket may have contacted an adjacent receptacle and the technician was led to believe he got the proper torque, thus caused the leak path. As you see right now, the FRCS is off. Well, the FRCS was on and we could not reach this receptacle. And as the 2005 return to flight launch day approached, there was no way to fix the problem. So after extensive analysis and approvals, a high-tech space sealant called RTV or room temperature vulcanizing sealant was applied and stopped the leak, but the temporary fix was only approved for one mission. So we flew STS-114, we came back, and due to this restricted configuration where we had RTV sealing around this receptacle to pre prevent the leak path, we had to remove the FRCS to replace it. But the repair of the bulkhead feed-through receptacle did not affect the thermal control system blankets. So when were the blankets installed wrong? Further investigation revealed that when the FRCS was removed from Discovery, it was transported from the orbiter processing facility to the hypergolic maintenance facility because NASA decided to do some maintenance on two fuel lines while the FRCS was removed from Discovery. This is when a dangerous mishap occurred that put two technicians in a life-threatening situation and finally revealed the answer to the mysterious blanket installation. To maneuver in space, fuel is burned to provide thrust, but without oxygen in space, spacecraft must also carry a chemical called oxidizer in order for the fuel to burn. Fuel is in one tank and the oxidizer is in another tank. When the two mix, the fuel burns, producing thrust. Both the fuel and the oxidizer used by the space shuttle are lethal to humans. So when any work is performed on the tanks or fuel lines, technicians are required to wear scape suits or self-contained atmospheric protective ensemble. Actual never before seen security footage of the repair operation shows the technicians as the deadly oxidizer is accidentally released. When the oxidizer mixes with water vapor, it becomes deadly nitric acid. It's oxidizer, it's vaporizing like crazy. Running down on their suits, and off their backs. And it's nasty stuff. Running down off the spill protection, cleaning up what was spilling as fast as they could, and there was nothing stopping. There was, there was, no, way, there was no way to stop it. Fought it the best we could till it finally ran out of propellant. The scape suits had done their job, protecting the technicians. Reached in with a tool and pulled the filter, and as soon as we pulled it, it I guess it broke that vacuum we had on there that was keeping it from coming out, and it just started burn out. When we enter these tanks like we do, it's well thought out, there's outlines written, everyone's agreed upon it. This outline, there were some things added, and the final purge that was agreed upon that well, not everyone agreed upon, we just did it. My leak meter told me something was wrong, and it was just a flash. It told me and I didn't listen. You know, you're in scape, let's move along. There's a lot of collateral damage. It had pretty much covered half the floor in green liquid while the tile got eaten up the next day they're just falling off they had to pull a lot of blankets a lot of blankets got scrapped you know there's some structures work corrosion up in there determined to send the frcs back to the orbiter processing facility on schedule cleanup operations continued around the clock numerous blankets including the blankets underneath the drain lines 
were damaged and had to be replaced. But in the rush to repair the damage, the new blankets were installed over the drain lines instead of behind. The design intent obviously was to install the blanket underneath the line because we have access slits on the blanket to provide that access. Uh, we typically install blankets against the structure in, in almost all cases. So it, just a typical installation would go against the structure. We have access slits which allow us to do so. But the original engineering drawing from 1984 was never changed to show why the slit was in the blanket and did not clearly indicate that the blanket was supposed to reside under the drain line. All I can say is that the drawing should have been more clear. Both blankets were installed incorrectly, and since the work on the FRCS was being performed in the hypergolic maintenance facility and discovery was in the orbiter processing facility, the technicians had no way of knowing the blankets would be in front of the vent ports when the FRCS was remated with Discovery. As the team wrapped up their investigation, the last unanswered questions were why did the closeout photo show the blanket properly installed? And even more importantly, how could the blankets be repaired without causing more problems so Discovery could fly again? An engineering drawing that was not updated, a crew cabin leak that required the removal of the forward reaction control system, a deadly oxidizer spill, and Suspended upside down for up to 20 minutes at a time. The access was very hard to get into. We both held each other by, uh, by our feet and uh, our belts. Pretty much what I did is I worked one-handed, take the blanket and fit it right underneath the line. We went through the uh, electrical access doors and the FRCS. Combination of holding each other and while upside down holding yourself on one of the support beams inside the FRCS. They were able to get down in there very difficult and work the blankets in behind the drain lines and do it a couple ties single-handedly and fix the problem for us. NASA learns from their mistakes. Changes were made to ensure these space mistakes never happened again for as long as the space shuttle was expected to fly. Well, now the installation drawing clearly shows a section, a view, showing the blanket installed underneath the line, clearly. And there's also a general note that says, make sure the blanket is installed underneath the line. It says, why? To limit billowing so the blanket does not intrude into the vent. Looking in sight glasses, we're doing different purges, we're purging longer. Verify that there is no liquid in there, we'll be able to see that it's gone. It should be fine. The space shuttle program symbolized the greatest of human engineering, a complex space transportation system that enabled the construction of the International Space Station and enabled discoveries that altered our understanding of life on Earth and our place in the universe. As humans continue to reach for the stars and are driven by the spirit of exploration, sometimes things go wrong. Minor mistakes can cascade into major problems, but the astronauts, technicians, and engineers who have dedicated themselves to exploring space will never let mistakes stop them. They innovate, fix the problems, and ultimately become better to go further and discover more.